What's up, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Block Party Podcast, Episode 3. I'm your boy, Truth Blitz. And it's your boy, Crypto Blood. And I want to go over today, we are both going to go over taxes again. After Everybody's new- favorite subject. I know, right? Taxes, the new Senate tax bill has passed. We've got Andrew Karnowski on, and he's a crypto tax expert. So he's going to help us out, see if there are any loopholes. Uh, explanations on new crypto tax laws and also donations in cryptos how is that going to be handled so once you guys have checked this out very informative video and you will be very pleased and we've got ladies and gents andrew karnowski i hope i said that properly uh, you did, you rg did. tax group llc drew thank you so much for joining us today on the block party podcast hey my pleasure yeah so um you know i reached out to you actually um before the new year right and we talked right via email and i was like you know i want to have you on but then you know i had ended up having another person you know reach out to me before you responded i'm like hey i still want to have you on we can talk and you're like let's wait after the tax bill comes out we see you know let's see what happens So um, what happened with this new Senate tax bill that passed? It's been a lot of uproar regarding this bill. And uh, let's kind of just go through the the general uh, ramifications of this bill. Yeah. Before we get into the crypto side. So with it, I mean, obviously, when they passed this bill, because of the bird rule, they had to make sure that it was revenue neutral. So I think there were some things that, you know, when you look at the House version, the Senate version, and what the final reconcile was, you can see kind of how they had to position it. They basically had to play a shell game of, well, who's going to end up paying more taxes, less taxes. And and overall, I think the average American is going to end up paying less taxes. You know, it might not be $10,000 less taxes, but it will definitely be, you know, a couple hundred to a thousand dollars, depending on your situation. Um, One big thing is they're trying to get away from people itemizing. Um, You know, I think there was a statistic. Uh, you know, 30% of taxpayers itemized before they're expecting 10% or less to itemize now. It basically did away a lot of the changes were on the Schedule A of what you can and can't itemize. Um, and then they also obviously gave limitations with what, you know, we call it salt, it's state and local taxes, uh, real estate taxes, and then real estate um, limitations on your mortgage. You know, it used to be that the first million dollars of indebtedness for a property you could claim that interest on your Schedule A. Mm-hmm. That's now gone to uh, seven. They, they ended up settling. You can tell who's got the best lobbyists. And it's definitely the National National Association of Realtors. Right. They went from a million dollars to seven hundred and fifty thousand wow. dollars of indebtedness. So there's a little bit of a haircut, but you know it's one of those things that ninety nine percent of the American public isn't going to get hit by. Yeah, it was really the guys in California, New York, and, and high cost of living areas that are really right. going to get hit, like Connecticut. <laughs> Yeah, Connecticut. Exactly. Nick is in Connecticut. <laughs> yep, yep. So, so what about <laughs> you, you, Nick? You, as I say, you want one of those one one random. There was a provision in the House bill originally that was, well, you know, if you live in Connecticut in this spot, have these different things, you'll end up paying a, a net tax of you know, I was thinking it was like one hundred and fifteen percent. Please tell me you didn't fall into that that no. uh, one one person in the world. I don't think so. <laughs> 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 well. Well, what about here? I uh, hear with this new tax bill, there have been some changes mm-hmm. with the personal tax brackets as well. well right. The the rates have dropped on. You know, I can I can pull up the chart, read through the chart. You know, I would encourage anyone to go look. I think you've got a CNN article linked there. Mm-hmm. They've got it pretty accurately there with the brackets. Um, overall, the brackets are shifting down as far as the the amount taxable. You know, they've combined some brackets. I believe it's no longer ten and fifteen. It's now twelve. Um, and then obviously with the doubled up standard deduction, that's going to shift it as well. So when you do that calculation for, you know, what tax you're paying, basically you take your total income, you subtract out any deductions, you know, whether standard or itemized, if you're one of those, one of those lucky people that's going to be itemizing. Um, and then from there you figure out your taxable income. And then based on those brackets, you pay that percentage of tax based on that bracket. So once you cross over to the next bracket, it doesn't change you know, from 12% to 20%, Mm -hmm. it changes, you know, every marginal dollar going forward. And so that's, I think, one thing people forget, too, is when they talk about brackets is, you know, it's a progressive tax. It's not, you know, once you cross over, everything's taxed at that new rate. So that's that's another thing that we want to make sure that people are being aware of, because it it ends up being a lot of confusion this time of year of, you know, oh, well, we don't want to make that extra dollar. Well, you know, pay the extra five cents in tax and, and keep, you know, an extra 70 cents in your pocket. So 
that that's definitely something we look at with the planning. So what about uh, stand like deductions though? We talked about prior to yeah. starting the, um, the the podcast. Uh, you, you know, you were saying that with existing this new bill kind of helps existing businesses, but it hurts new businesses, mm-hmm. right? Well, it's there, there's pros and cons to it. Um, mm-hmm. The the hard thing that that really hits people is you know I, I know you guys have talked on the show about the ten thirty one exchange. Um, if you have a lot of assets and you're a high turnover business, ten thirty one is gone across the board for anything but real estate. So if you had, you know, semi trucks, you know, manufacturing equipment that you're used to trading it in and, you know, or selling it within 30 or 45 days and buying new, you no longer get to roll over any gains on that. So as you're depreciating out property, you know, you have the potential to recapture uh, that depreciation, the expense that you got in years prior, that's gone now. So I think there's a lot of people that are going to be holding on to things a lot longer, um, or they're just going to scrap it and not, not sell old used equipment. Um, we'll be, I'll be very curious to see in the next year or so what that means. The other nice thing though, too, is there's some, uh, bonus depreciation rules, uh, that are kicked off into effect with this new bill for the next two years. That's a little bit more on my side as far as, you know, high level nerdy tax stuff. Okay. Um, but companies can basically write off hundred percent of the assets instead of having to depreciate them out. But there's a little bit of give and take there. Oh, nice. uh, it, it really depends on, on your circumstance. And obviously any, any advice that I give here, you know, don't take that as, as gold. Everyone's taxes are different. The, the law can be applied to one person, 100 people, depending on your specific situation. It might be a little bit different than your neighbor. So obviously talk to a tax professional before acting on anything. Um, or, you know, give me a call and we can run through, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I, I think I've got about 200 people that have reached out so far uh, just asking for help with crypto stuff. And we, we've taken 15 minutes to talk with all of them. We don't charge anybody a dime just to get that initial conversation going because we do believe in getting information out there making sure that taxpayers aren't paying more than they absolutely have to. I think it's your God given right as an American to pay the least amount of taxes legally that you can. Nice. Yeah. So we've got his information, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, just peek over to the screen, you'll see Drew's info there and uh, yeah, give him a call, email him. I don't think we have his phone number, but we do have his email up there. Uh, So definitely reach out. And let me just double check, uh, Drew. I want to see if there was anything else before we move yeah. forward. Well, Let me see. Go ahead. One thing. So they're, they're doubling the standard deduction pretty much across the board. They're also getting rid yeah, of I personal exemptions. So mm-hmm. every every dependent that you claimed, and, you know, obviously if you're you're married, then you have, you know, one for you, one for your spouse, or, you know, just one for you. Um, that was about a $4,000 deduction. They're doing away with that. Um, they've kind of balanced that, though. You know, if you have kids under age 17, I believe, um, you're getting the child tax credit. And, and you have always have to remember, deductions and credits are two very different things. Right. A deduction basically reduces your taxable income. Credit matches tax dollar for dollar. So anytime that you can pick up a credit for anything, credits better. are the way to go. Right. You know, 25% tax rate, that's, you know, about $4 worth of deduction equals $1 of credit. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of things like that, that, you know, if you've got multiple kids, you know, I've seen a lot of people push back on the whole personal exemption thing. I believe it's $1,200 of refundable tax credit that that would actually be better for people with kids because you know if it ends up going over they're getting paid by the government basically for having kids so that's hmm. that will bounce off and, and offset some of the, the personal exemptions the problem is as soon as junior turns 18 they should probably get a job and move out or at least that's what i was told when i was growing up you hit, you junior, hit 18 you're out the it's door it's time to go <laughs> <laughs> gotta earn your keys. Right, right right all right <laughs> Okay, so that's a pretty good overview that you gave to us, Drew. But what we really wanted you to come on today for was the crypto taxes or crypto tax yeah, implication of this bill. So uh, tell us a little bit, if you can, um, what this new tax bill means for cryptos and what was actually put in there uh, regarding yeah. cryptocurrencies. So, so there's not anything that is explicitly geared towards crypto. Obviously, the the 1031 is probably the biggest issue. Right. Um, you know, crypto investors, you know, guys that aren't day trading, you know, and, and we can get into that in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, your, your average investor that's buying and holding and, and letting it go for a year, they're not going to see any other change other than obviously standard deduction is going to make it a little bit better for them when we do the calculations. Two, um, capital gains rates, they, they basically tied those to the the new tax uh, rates. So that once again, th- there'll be a little bit of bump, but I wouldn't basically bet the farm on that being how you're going to get around taxes. Mm-hmm. 
you know, with, with it, from my, you know, from my standpoint and everything that I've done and the research I've seen, I didn't think 1031 really applied to cryptocurrency. You know, I've, mm-hmm. I've done a lot of research in the last six months. I know it's not always a popular opinion. No one likes paying taxes, especially on crypto. You know, if it's sitting in crypto, it's really hard to justify. Well, let's cash this out to fiat to pay the government who is kind of picking up on, you know, once again, any kind of investment activity that you do, I, I happen to believe, you know, you should be able to keep as much as you can. Obviously, that's not tax law. On, and I just want to clarify, any kind of income that you have from investments is taxable. There are some taxable events within trading crypto to crypto. I don't think we're going to be able to defer it through 1031 exchange. Um, and a big reason for that is I just don't see a tax court ruling in favor of cryptocurrency. Now, just because they don't explicitly say it doesn't mean necessarily that you could probably get away with that stance in a court. And if you believe that the, you know, you know, I've seen you guys talk about deep state before. If the deep state's out to get crypto, you know, they're going to rule through the, the tax courts. You, you can't necessarily Absolutely. rely on the courts to do what's right there. Yep. So I, I, I just think from my perspective, if we file without 1031 ahead of time, they can't come back and say, well, we need to redo this. If, once those courts get decided or cases get decided, they're going to come back after the, especially the big traders that, that are deferring millions of dollars. And they're going to hit you with an accuracy related penalty of 20% on the tax. So you owe all the tax that you owed plus an extra 20%. And, you know, I've seen a couple of professionals on other shows talk about, well, you know, it's very easy to get penalty abatements through and, and get those removed. Mm-mm. That is one of the most difficult things to do with the IRS. You are basically begging them to pull penalties off. And the first time penalty abatement that some of them reference does not apply to accuracy related penalties. So just be very, very cautious on the positions that you take because you don't want to end up having substantial understatement or criminal, criminal charges of avoiding taxes. So that would be my... My plea is, you know, think before you act. You know, sometimes we have to play the game. If we want to normalize it and keep getting little old ladies to invest in it and driving up the price, we've got to bring things into the light. We've got to, we've got to normalize it a little bit for, for the average American. Like I said, Al Capone got away with murder, but they got him for tax evasion. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and it was funny. So I just watched a documentary on that. Um, it used to be there was no income tax in 1930 or 13. Yep. The big push for... You know, the, the government got their money from tax and booze. They yep. had excise taxes only. Once the prohibition came in and, and they basically came through and said, well, we're not going to have this revenue source, the prohibitionists actually pushed for an income tax to, to give the government incentive to get away from booze and ban booze. So, oh, you know, if, oh, if you're well, feeling it, angry it, about taxes. Yeah, and that, and that happened all around when um, the Federal Reserve was created, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, 19, what, 1913? Yeah. Right. That was, yeah, I think it was a little bit after. That was a little bit after the Federal Reserve was created, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So I thought, uh, I actually thought the tax, uh, federal taxes or whatnot were created um, right around when the Federal Reserve was created, but I could definitely be wrong on that one. Um, So what do you, Nick, did you have anything you wanted to? Mm. comment on with that regards to what what drew just spoke on uh i mean i do have so you don't you don't see do you see maybe any because i feel like this was this was like putting maybe they didn't mention crypto specifically but i feel like this was put in place Mm -hmm. to, to deter people from getting into crypto um because I know they have people looking into this. They can play stupid and act like they don't know really, you know, know what's going on. But they know people are making yeah. a ton of money on crypto. They know that there was a gray area where people really weren't paying mm-hmm. taxes on it. So I feel like this was kind of put in place to deter people like, oh, well, if this isn't going to be worth uh, the taxes I'm going to have to pay, then I'm just not going to get involved in it. Um, so, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just my opinion. But, um, you know, basically you see like any do you see anything getting changed on this or no or is this pretty much pr- probably going to be the way it's going to be like because you can't go if i want to go buy yeah. you know go buy a specific cryptocurrency i have to trade it and i can't just go buy right. that in u.s dollar you know what i mean i have to buy bitcoin right. or Ethereum first so it's like really you know i don't know i mean triple taxation right yeah well, and, and so here's the thing is when, when you're trading crypto to crypto, mm-hmm. uh, your basis in that new crypto that you're buying steps up. You recognize that gain, you pay tax on that gain. That's part of the basis of your new crypto. So you're not necessarily going off the full mar- market value price. And that's why the accounting is so important is, you know, what do we buy it for? What are we selling it for? Realize the fair market value there. 
and apply that to the new new game. That's why you know you really need to use some software. You know, personally, I use Bitcoin.tax. You know, there's Coin Tracker. There's probably going to be you know five or six more in a year. You know, just given the size of the market and the growing. Um, so, yeah, there. The, to me, it's not triple taxation. The, the the amount should calculate out roughly to be the same. The difference is timing. You know, okay. it's basically instead of being able to defer everything, you know, when you trade crypto to crypto, you don't get to carry over the the, the term. You mm-hmm. know, if it's at six months, that's a short term capital gain versus, you know, if you were to turn around and sell that new crypto at a year, that would be, you know, long term if you held it for a year. So to me, right. that would be one of those things that that would be if we could get that in place, that would change the discussion completely of, OK, well, how do we move this money around? And I think there's a lot of people that were trading very rapidly in 2017 that now are going to have a tax bill that they weren't prepared for and didn't think about because it's not like they're teaching taxes in schools. You know, I, I, I had to study on my own. I had to, to get my own certifications and, and read the law. Um, I think there's a, pe- a lot of people that are in for a big surprise that want to hold on long term and don't want to have to keep cashing out. And then every time you cash out, you owe taxes on the new part that you cashed out and this, the cycle continues. Um, so with that, you know, I, I could maybe see the tax laws changing. The, the big question is, are the Republicans going to have a majority in the Senate? If they can get that 60 seat majority, I think they can do the things that they wanted to do with the way that they passed the law. Now they had to make it revenue neutral. So they had to play some games as far as the numbers go. And I think that that's where we see 1031 dropping off. That's where we see, you know, the, the personal exemptions dropping off the, the schedule a items, the itemized deductions getting completely changed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not going to plug any political party, you know, obviously check your candidates, but that would be the only situation in which I could see, any sort of change happening and, and things being better. The government's got to cut their budget in order to stay solvent. Otherwise we're just running at a deficit. Like we have been for what a decade, two decades now, right. you know, honestly, we, we need to get, you know, a little bit more feisty with our representatives and holding them more accountable. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see Rand Paul have been, have, have voted for this. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. That's the whole nother story, but, um, I do have a couple other questions here. Um, yeah. One being, so say I bought Populous this year in 2018, and I'm going to use that yep. as an example, Populous. Um, yeah. So I bought Populous. I, I took ETH. I used that to buy Populous. I did not cash okay. that out this year. I carry it off until next year, and, and, I, and I'm still holding it. So I have to pay capital gains on on that uh, when I do my taxes in 2019, even though I did not cash that out. Correct. Even if it doesn't move to to fiat because you're exchanging one currency for another, mm-hmm. they treat that as if it were a sale. It doesn't have to have dollars involved. You would basically look and say, what's the fair market value of the ETH at that time, and then we transfer that basis up into the populace, and then whenever you sell the populace, we'll, we'll, at whatever price it is, minus that new basis, and that's how you'd figure out you know the final gains. See, this is the part that so, pisses me so, off because – oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. No, I, I, so I'm just – so does that mean – so that shouldn't be much of a tax, uh, taxable event then at that point if we're doing it that way, if he's – right? So, so, so let's say, you know, he buys – I'll use just simple numbers. Okay. You know, um, at January 1st, you know, Nick buys a dollar worth of ETH. Okay. February 1st, he buy, you know, he takes that dollar's worth of ETH. It's now worth $10. Okay. He uses that $10 to buy the populace. Mm-hmm. The populace now has a basis of $10. You have to recognize a $9 capital gain. Now, if, you know, six months from now, that populace is worth $11, you only have $1 of capital gain because your right. basis in the populace is 10 So the, the issue isn't, you know, obviously with cryptos, things go up and down like crazy. You know, a year is a lifetime in cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. When you have a thousand percent returns you're going to run a, you know into some taxes so one thing that we've looked at with a lot of our clients is you know if you can buy a pool of eth and sit on it for a year or you know only trade a small portion of it and then when we get to the next year and you have that long-term capital gains that's what we're going to use to start investing in icos that you're going to hold long term mm. they're trying to make sure that there's not a lot of changeover you know really in the law um of people who are moving transactions rapidly are going to pay taxes on each of those transactions. And it works in the inverse too. You know, if that populace drops down to $9, now all of a sudden you have a dollar of capital loss. So one thing that you need to balance is, you know, are we losing money? Are we gaining money? When are we timing our trade outs? When are we timing our trade ins? And that, that takes a lot of, you know, intentionality in a lot of ways and a lot of having to know where you're at. I think there's some people that really bought in and they watched it go up and they don't know where they're at and they don't know where to go next to, to best be in a good situation for themselves. 
Okay, but meanwhile, they're they're trying to do not do away with, but they're trying to make it harder uh, for people to invest in ICOs. So, uh, you know, and I mm -hmm. get what you're saying that you know that would make the most sense tax wise, but you know, then you got the regulatory commissions trying to, you oh, know, for sure. SEC trying to you know make quote unquote utility tokens, you know, and deem them securities mm -hmm. now. So, uh, or at least so I've heard. Um, yeah. Well, and and that that's you know. They're, they're really pushing now that you have to be an accredited investor right and you have to have a million dollars net worth and then i've reached out to the sec and, and tried to get a hold of someone and just say does cryptocurrency count towards this i mean there are guys that are literally sitting on piles of, of millions of dollars that want to invest and they want to do things right mm -hmm. and i'm still waiting to hear i, I mean I, well, I we, like know, we know we know they're going to say yeah, yeah we know they're going to say no cryptos don't count <laughs> Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I, like, or, or they're going to they're gonna put you at a huge discount. You know, oh, yeah, it's only 50% of the fair market value averaged over three years, which, man. you know, for Ethereum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, but like I said, I, I, will, I will do what I can to get answers, you know, right. and, and I'll keep shouting into the void. And, and eventually they're going to have to answer somebody. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree. And, and I, I laugh every time I hear, you know, well, it's to protect the little investors. It's to protect no, the, the children. I yeah. No, well, no, you're, you're just trying to keep something in, in, in a very specific set. Correct. Um, you know, there, there's so many different things that you can do within this space. And, and the, the biggest thing, and I've seen a couple other people talk on this too, is, you know, it used to be, you know, you would go to a, a stock broker and obviously I'm not against having, I guess, to register to know your customer laws. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, the, you know, it, it, it's not about terrorism. It's about taxes. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're claiming everything anyways, it's a non-issue. Um, you know, the, the hard thing is the regulatory side adds so much cost to these brokerages. And, and if we're going to make Coinbase responsible for reporting to the IRS whenever we have anything moving over $20,000, now all of a sudden Coinbase has to hire on staff. They have to charge more fees, things like that. But you can still buy fractional cryptocurrency. You know, even if you've got $10 in your pocket, you can still buy Bitcoin. You can still buy Ethereum. You can still buy Litecoin. To me, I, I see that as a benefit because what used to be really cost prohibitive is you couldn't buy half a share of stock. True. You always had to buy a full stock. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at this as, you know, lower income individuals that, you know, maybe can carve out $50 a week here or there and right. things like that can still get in and they can grow. You know, the hard thing is, well, now they have to figure out how they're going to track these trades and, and definitely, you know, stay in compliance and, and all these issues. And it's harder to get to, you know, things that aren't listed on major markets, you know, to get to Cryptopia, you have to basically take that Ethereum and either send it out there and convert it to Bitcoin at their site and then calculate that gain. And then it, it can become a real nightmare for a lot of people really quickly. And it, right. the, the reason why people like traditional stocks and things like that is because it's so regulated. Those brokerages have to report that to you. So you don't have to think about what you're doing there. Mm. So, now, I wouldn't advise the, that. Always, always look at your portfolio. Yeah. So on the subject of Coinbase, I have two questions regarding mm -hmm. Coinbase. Yeah. Um, one of our buddies, Silvertooth, he did a video uh, maybe about two weeks ago, and he was mm -hmm. reading something from Coinbase, and his interpretation of it was that if I move crypto from Coinbase to an external wallet, that's a taxable mm -hmm. event. Is that true? I, I didn't, I wasn't sure about so, that. Yeah, so when, when you move any kind of, cryptocurrency from one wallet that you own to another wallet that you own, it's not taxable. It's no different okay. than taking a gold bar out of a safety deposit box at one bank and moving it to another. Okay. okay. Obviously you'll still want to track any fees. You can add those to the basis. Um, we want to be calculating that portion of it. Mm -hmm. The main reason why they're doing that is because the treasury, I, I think, uh, Oh gosh, it was maybe three or four months ago. Um, basically updated their guidance for who has to report foreign income and, and, and the amounts of things like that. And they specifically li listed electronic currencies, cryptocurrency. Right. I so the I idea is mm -hmm. Coinbase losing that lawsuit earlier this year where they had right. to divulge you know, anything over $20,000 uh, from 13 to 15. The IRS now has a, a door in. I've seen some, some theories of, well, they're also pulling it from donation links on YouTube and everyone's saying, well, you know, hey, donate here. They're, they're building basically the blockchain's public. There's not yes. really any secrets for, for the major blockchain. The IRS has hired out a firm called Chain Analysis to develop software for them to, to basically mm -hmm. scrub the blockchain and help them build a case. Whether or not they can act on that, that's a 14-hour discussion about budgets and, and timing and, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I think the IRS is coming. I think in the next three to five years, we're going to see a lot of landmark cases of people that tried to get away with it, and, and they're going to get the book thrown at them. That's criminal tax evasion. Um, when you start moving your money off exchanges, to foreign exchanges, if you've got more than, I think it's either five or $10,000 abroad, you just have to disclose on your tax return, hey, I've got this much money 
held abroad. You know, I, I personally invest in KuCoin. That's in Hong Kong. I've got more money abroad than than the limitation. So on my return, I fill out, you know, 30 seconds, I click here. I've got assets in Hong Kong, and we're good to go. And that's, once again, part of that terrorism law of we need to know that you're not deliberately funding funding terrorism. Mm-hmm. But it's all about, well, what are you doing abroad? We know that if you've got income abroad, you should be claiming foreign income and making sure that that matches up with your taxes. So my, so my, if you've got, my second go question, I'm sorry to cut you off. My, yeah. my second question pertaining to Coinbase um, really was, so if, you know, we don't have to, we're not taxed on transferring in and out, but mm-hmm. this landmark case that, that Coinbase essentially lost against I, the IRS for 2013 through 15, the, uh, mm-hmm. the IRS being able to get those, those uh, customer records. What about 16, 17, and now 18 and going forward perpetually? Are they able to grab those records from Coinbase, or or does Coinbase even have to disclose that? Because I'm hearing you know, that they I, don't. I think, yeah, I I think if Coinbase has legal counsel, which obviously they do, um, I, I've noticed when I log on, it says you know make Please sure you pay taxes. your taxes. Yeah. yeah, that that tells me that they're going to get in compliance real quick. I don't think they want to go before the courts again and have to fight with the IRS. I, I think now that there's precedence that the IRS can get that information. The best thing Coinbase can do is, is being in compliance. Same with any U.S.-based exchange. I, I think they they're going to get the book thrown at them. Um, I think 2017 they'll probably issue what they've done for 13, uh, 14, and 15. I don't know. I don't have anybody inside at Coinbase that I'm getting direct answers from on that. Um, okay. I think Coinbase is probably going to have to act in good faith if they want to continue to do business in the United States. I've noticed that they've mentioned that they're an official money changing service which is a very specific designation, which means that they have to report when there's major transactions. Mm. Um, so to me, I, I think that, that the cat's out of the bag. You know, anyone who thought there was anonymity in Coinbase, sorry, but that, that circus has ended. You know, the other thing too is if you're in a situation where the IRS is pursuing collections against you, because of the FDIC and the, the ties to banks, the IRS can go in and they can pull records from your banks without you supplying them they just need to know that you've got you know you, every time you register with a social security number you've got your your stamp on that they can do a basically a mass search in a county that you live in and they can pull that information I've, I've seen that all the time i used to work with guys that owed millions of dollars in back taxes and they can go in and they can levy those accounts they don't need your permission to do that so they, they can build a, a really compelling case if they know where to look all they have to see is coinbase transactions and they, they know that you've got crypto of some sort now the onus is on you to prove whether or not you know you were trading it, you were holding it, and, and the ball's in your court. Mm. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, so. you, you mentioned, I have a couple now. You mentioned um, trading. Now, for example, yeah. I, I trade with a trading bot. So basically that, okay. that becomes the basically not worth is, doing. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, are, the, question is, the question is, are you making money? You know, if you're making gains, you, you'll never pay. And, and this is, I think, where there's some confusion. If you're doing your accounting right and, mm-hmm. and you're doing everything up to snuff, you should never pay more than the gains that you had. So if your bot just eats it and we create a, a crap ton of loss, you know, you burn through your stack, we're going to write that off as a loss against other gains elsewhere. Um, okay. if, if you're climbing up, you know, the, the question is whether or not you've got the liquidity to pay those taxes come, pardon me, April 15th. Um, if you're in a situation where you want to hold on to that either stack, for example, we can get you on a payment plan. That, that'll keep you safe from the IRS. You know, obviously, you'll pay interest, and there'll be a little bit of penalties associated depending on the amount. But you can still get into an arrangement with the IRS where you don't have to lump sum pay it. You can pay it off over uh, you know, up to 72 months, depending on the situation, or, or longer, depending on how much red, red tape you want to cut through. Right. Um, so you do have options. You know, I, I wouldn't say you know, if it's making money, don't shut it down. Keep that sucker running. Let's get a little bit creative with it. You know, let's take a look at, you know, does it make more sense to maybe hold it through a corporation? Are your, yeah. your capital gains rates, you know, that was the other thing too about the new tax bill is corporate rates are frozen at 21%. That's capital gains, that's regular income, all that stuff. Maybe it makes more sense to throw it through a corporation, but that's going to vary on a case by case basis. Right. Um, you know, if you've got significant gains and you're going to have them all short term, yeah, heck yeah, let's look at freezing it at 21% instead of going up to you know, I think 37 or more. Right. There's a lot of things that you can do with that. Because I, I did read there was some kind of, um, somewhat of a loophole for high frequency traders and you have to go through an LLC. Is that correct? Uh, the, the thing that you have to kind of balance with that is whether or not, you know, you're going to 
end up paying self-employment tax. So the okay. benefit is you get to deduct off your expenses. Um, for me, I, I see high frequency traders as one, one group that there might be some good there. Obviously it's still going to be gains of sorts. Um, mm-hmm. you basically move everything to short term at that point. You know, okay. if you're not holding anything for long term, you lose out on that, that benefit. There's no longer short and long, it's only mm-hmm. short. Um, to me, it's more exciting to look at miners, you know, guys that are especially doing some of this virtual mining. I personally use Hashflare. Um, some of these, uh, coins that are staking, you know, I have been looking into, uh, I think it's called Footy Cash, I think it's XFRT. Um, you only need 5,000 coins to start staking. They're still a low cost coin. The, the development team seems good. Um, obviously, you know, do your own due diligence before you invest in anything that you hear the tax guy saying. Um, but you can create revenue streams there and that's treated as self-employment tax. So the IRS didn't really give us great guidance on buying, holding, trading cryptos. But in that notice, it's uh, notice 24-21 or 2014-21, they specifically say that mining cryptocurrencies is self-employment income. income. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the nice thing about the new law, so we, we do away with 1031 exchange, but when you mine that cryptocurrency, you're going to pay tax on what, when you receive that reward, that's considered income at the fair market value at that time. You take that and you subtract out your expenses. So when you're doing things like hash flare and you're paying, you know, 50 bucks for a year long contract, and at the end of the year, you're going to have, you know, basically, uh, I've seen the projections to be about uh, $100 worth of Ethereum. I've already got a, a $50 deduction right there. At the end of the year, I'm going to have $100 worth of Ethereum that has a basis of $100, regardless of what I pay within right. my corporation. So the idea is if I can come up with other expenses, you know, my cell phone bill, you can hire on a, a spouse, certain kids. There's things that we can do to get really creative with it. That, you know, you know, all of a sudden that LLC, we can step that LLC up to an S corp, you know, an LLC filed as in a sub chapter S and all those gains will still flow through to you as short term gains, but with no self-employment tax. Now a portion you'll have to have pay employment taxes on, but now I've got something that I can take that 20% deduction right off the top. So it become, becomes a very big shell game of how do we make sure that we are doing things obviously by the book, but we can play within their rules to create market, fair market rate crypto. So if you've got crypto that you're holding at long term capital gains now, cash that out into contracts for mining and then have fair market crypto later. And you basically pay, you get the best of both worlds where you get your long-term capital gains. And then all of a sudden you've got short-term capital gains, but it's at a much, much lower tax rate. So you can still be trading. So it's things like that. You know, we've sat down with a lot of customers and and it obviously, once again, completely depends on your situation, but there's some guys where that makes a lot of sense and we can Mm -hmm. definitely, definitely beat the IRS at their own game. Mm -hmm. Now I I do have another question and, before I ask this, I'm going to let everybody know that whatever you answer, you know, you're not telling people how to get away without paying taxes. So right. I, do, I do want to ask this. Um, isn't it going to be relatively hard for the IRS to, for example, if you're doing a lot of trading on like Ether Delta, um, mm-hmm. where, where you don't have a name tied to your you know, there's no KYC. You don't have a name tied to your to your account, um, and you know you're kind of moving stuff around a lot. Isn't it going to be very hard for them to track and really know exactly what you have? Is it where it, where it pretty much comes down to to you just being you know forthright and, and honest with them? Yeah, you know, if if the blockchain wasn't public, you mm-hmm. know, if there weren't things that we you know we could see money coming into Ether Delta. Um, and they didn't hire out a firm like Chain Analysis. I, I think you could maybe maybe in some some world probably get away with that i think they're going to be looking and they're going to devote a lot of resources to making an example of cryptocurrency traders um Mm -hmm. there's a just i mean look at the news they every time bitcoin hits a new all-time high or you know ethereum goes up they lose their minds the the irs knows that there's people with a lot of a lot of income and a lot of you know people that haven't filed anything i think uh in the coinbase proceedings i saw you know only 800 of 23,000 us users on coinbase filed any crypto related taxes that looks really bad on the irs they, yeah. they're devoting uh, i think they're, they're building a task force they've got software you know yeah you might get away with it but if they do find you there's no statute of limitations on criminal tax evasion they've got all the time in the world and that 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 past information it's there you know even using shapeshift or, or even you know monero unless you want to yeah you know, i don't know how you realize the value without pulling out to other other currencies or pulling out to fiat they'll catch you at some point it's mm-hmm. going to hit your bank account if you're if you're not trading that specifically and, and yeah, maybe we'll get to the point where we're using Monero to, you know, fill up for gas and things like that. But then they know that the business owner is taking Monero and they're going to go after the business owner and they're going to get their, their taxes one way or the other. So 
Yeah, yeah that's, you can play that's where I think it, we're going to ultimately get to. Um, me personally, just having a technical background, I don't see, even with the chain analysis company and all of that, if they, if you like use some type of mixer or Monero, mm -hmm. any of these anonymous coins that have a very strong, uh, you know, an anonymous algorithm, I don't see them being able to really stop people or not stop people, but track people efficiently yeah. because it's all about a, an efficiency thing with the IRS. They can't devote that much time and money to something where it's still a, if you look in the grand scheme of things, it's still a small market mm -hmm. versus your fiat uh, tax evasions that that's going on. So I think this is just my theory, Drew. I think they're going to do a point of sale, like a VAT tax type of scenario where, hey, they're like, mm -hmm. OK, we're just going to tax where it's coming out, where the exchange for goods or services uh, happened. W what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, I, I don't see the U.S. moving to a VAT tax. Okay. Um, I think that's one thing that, you know, we get to kind of rub in Europe's face is we don't we don't have that. Um, right. Yeah, I can see, you know. I've seen this a little bit with software as a service and things along those lines. Um, and obviously Amazon is now starting to have to collect sales tax. I could see the States maybe doing a point of sale tax. Okay. Um, but you know, that, that depends on whether or not there's going to be court precedents that the state can get their cut. Um, I think maybe in the next five to 10 years, we'll start to see some of that. Um, but as of right now, I, I don't see that, you know, in a, as a near future item to me, you know, the IRS is really looking at it from an income tax perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, if you, they see someone living a certain lifestyle, you know, if we're talking to someone who's doing, you know, a thousand dollars worth of trading a year, yeah, they're probably going to go under the radar. Um, there's always that chance to audit. You'd be amazed what they catch and what they don't catch. Um, but the, the big cases, you know, the guys that are crypto millionaires now, they're not going to get away with this. There, there's no way that the IRS is going to let that slide. Um, and, and from my perspective, you know, yeah, you can go ahead and change things into anonymous coins, things like that. But for me, the value is being able to realize the fiat that I can pull out from crypto. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if if at any point that the IRS does develop the resources or Congress, you know, decides, hey, we're tripling your budget, we're going to go after this. Um, or, you know, they get pushed back from, from lobbyists to get that, that funding. You know, you could make a really compelling case if you believe that, you know, the deep state is actively working against crypto. The IRS is going to have every resource that they need to, to go after as much as they can, and they're going to make it as scary as possible. I don't think they can get to the point where they can outright ban cryptocurrencies. I think we're past the point of no return in the U.S. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the IRS will get more resources for that because it is a black eye for them to have people moving this money around, creating a massive amount of wealth, and then not paying any tax on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll, they'll look at lifestyle. You know, do you have a brand new shiny car? You know, did you report ten dollars of income on your your tax return, but you live in a $2 million mansion. Right. Uh, it's the same way that they catch, you know, drug dealers. Now, obviously drug yeah. dealers aren't the ones using cryptocurrency. And if you are doing illegal things with cryptocurrency, don't. And once it's all public, you've left uh, basically a paper trail. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously I'm not advocating any kind of crime or a tax, you know, a, a criminal attorney or anything along those lines. I do tax prep. I do compliance. My main goal is to make sure that my guys aren't getting hit with that extra 20% penalty on top of owing the tax. Right. That's why I get paid what I get paid is because I help people, minimize what they owe overall mm -hmm. so for somebody i got a question first of all do you think the irs yeah. is really going to be able to manage this you know what i mean i i think that there's going to be enough political impetus behind them that they're going to have to do something and show some wins um you'd be amazed how many audits now happen via correspondence so basically i mail in a letter and say you know i get a letter from the IRS saying hey we need to see this 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 and this we don't think your return's correct they catch it through and you know uh, software on their end, and then it goes to someone who's sitting in a desk in Ohio, I'm in Kentucky, I mail off all my supporting documents and we do the entire audit by phone. Mm -hmm. There are cases where they'll send out local local guys. You know, I don't think it's going to be, you know, jackbooted Gestapo kicking down doors and taking down crypto investors, but I think they'll bury people in paperwork and they'll, they'll send some spook letters and some people, if they've got the good records and they've done what they're supposed to do, will end those audits very quickly. Other people will end up having to prove every single transaction um, that the IRS will throw back at them. Now you can request to see what the IRS has for freedom of information, but that takes some time to process. And you've got, you've got timelines in an audit that you have to hit. Otherwise you're going to be in trouble. You know, you always can get stays and things like that. And you can work around that and you can get settlement options with the IRS. But if you're leading the charge, I think you'll run into a lot less issues and a lot more leniency. If you're the one bringing the information to them and saying, here's what we've got, here's how we've structured it. So when you do get to the point of cashing out large sums, 
you're already in the clear. It's the guys that have tried to hide it for years that now are going, well, crap, I've got $4 million. What do I do? Well, we're going to go back and we're going to go file those returns and you're going to take your lumps. And then when we cash out this year, you'll be good to go. Okay. And then another question here is, say, for example, somebody did not work on the books this mm-hmm. year, right? Or, or, yeah, we'll call it this year. So they had no on the books income and pretty much lived off of their cryptos, right? So mm-hmm. does that mean since if you if obviously if you are realizing, you know, and turning into fiat before a year, you're paying short term, but um, basically are you getting put in, you're obviously getting put in the lowest tax bracket on that, correct? Yeah. So I I mean so let's, let's run through kind of an example um, with the new tax law. If you've got a couple um, and let's say they're, they were good enough to hold on to, to their Ethereum for a year, they're not doing a lot of trading. They just bought and hold um, in that long-term tax bracket. I believe the, the cutoff is $77,000 that you can pull out long-term capital gains at 0%. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so important. If you're not having to trade and, and do high volatility trading or high volume trading, Part of your strategy should, should be, how do I get that long-term crypto portfolio so I can start pulling some of the gains out and not have to pay taxes on it? You know, once you start doing that, that rapid trading, you know, you're realizing gains very quickly. If you can get out of that, get out of that. You know, if you're going to do that and keep building wealth, be prepared that there's going to be some taxes that you're going to have to pay. But in, in a situation like you're talking about, if it's long-term, they probably don't owe taxes. It's still a good idea to file just in case mm-hmm. one for uh, informational security purposes you know someone can't go and file a fraudulent return for you we've seen a huge uptick of that in the last three years and two you're disclosing what you had to disclose you still don't owe any tax you're in the clear so to me there's no benefit to, to basically hiding that and squirreling that away okay Chris, cb you got anything um no let me see here so i think oh there was one question i did have one question um, I do have one question regarding um, there's been a new um, use case or you, we, we're seeing more people using these debit crypto cards. OK, so yep. help us understand how that uh, plays into taxes, all that good stuff with that. Yeah, so that that's going to be treated just like any other sale. It's going to depend on the crypto that you use to load on that card. Is it short term? Is it long term? Those things concern me a little bit. I'm great, great, very grateful that a group has gone out and created debit cards so that people can actually realize the value of their crypto without having to go through the process of, well, so I sell it, I move it to my bank account, and then I can pull, pull it off. But I don't think people realize that there is no provision to exclude you know, a de minimis amount. That's treated as a sale like any other. There was a bill that was introduced, I think, to committee, but never passed out of committee in the Senate. I think uh, it was the guy, uh, Corey Gardner from Colorado, they were trying to say, well, we'll treat it like, you know, de minimis currency of foreign currency where, you know, the first $600 of any transaction that you do is, yeah. is tax free. That way we can encourage people to use it. Unfortunately, that's completely dropped off. Damn. Um, they, they never passed that out of committee or committee. So don't take that as any kind of indication of what the, the laws are going to be. That's going to be treated just like any kind of sale, you know, otherwise, even though it's point of sale, track your records, keep good records on that. Don't go crazy because you'll end up paying taxes on that anyways. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. So for somebody like, I'm gonna use. I'm just gonna use myself an example. I, I, yeah. I use. Yeah. Bitcoin tell on yourself. Card. Tell on yourself. I will. Why Go not? Ahead. So I use a BitPay <laughs> card to um, basically convert what money I'll need for the month. You know what I mean? And um, mm-hmm. and I've been. I mean, I did this because it allows me to not have to go to work, back to work full time, and stay home with my kids. So. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So basically, that's what I'm doing. I'll convert what I need for the month to pay my bills, and then you know I'll send that to my BitPay card, and then that's what I do. So, um, yeah. So that's I mean, pretty much goes with what you know the first question I asked you before. But um, I mean, is it not worth doing that? I mean, it's, here's the thing: is it it from a transactional standpoint? You can either have every time that you swipe that card. So with, with BitPay, are you preloading Bitcoin on that card that you already no, were holding? You preload it and convert. Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin that I was already holding, and then it gets converted to U.S. dollars under the card. Okay. That that's treated no different than you know if you were to sell it on Coinbase and then wire that money to your bank. Right. 
Right. So you've got one 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 sale there. Once you start swiping that BitPay card, mm-hmm. it's just like any other debit card. You're not paying right. extra tax. And obviously, you have your sales tax and local stuff like that. Um, but for me, I, I think there was a couple cards out there that was, you know, I transfer X number of Litecoin to a wallet through the service. And as I swipe that card, they sell the equivalent amount USD in Litecoin mm. plus whatever transaction fees. The thing that I'm getting at is if you're doing a one-time transaction to load the card, awesome. That, that makes it easy. You don't have to, to deal with back and forth. The fees are probably, you know, at the same, if not a little bit lower, and you've got that money probably instantaneously. Mm-hmm. The ones that I have issue with is if I'm loading crypto onto a card, not converting it to fiat at that time, every time I swipe that, that's a sale on the crypto side. So now instead of having one transaction to calculate, I've got 30 every month. You know, right. I went to the, the gas station, got gas. There's a sale. I went to the movie theater. There's a sale. Hey, I got Arby's. There's a sale. That's going to add a headache for a lot of people of having to figure out all of those individual sales as they're compiling these records. Simplify it. Keep it to one sale if you can. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. That that makes that definitely makes sense. Um, I'm trying to think if I got anything else. Um, I did. One. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, to cut you off. One thing no. I want to bring up too is uh, I get a lot of questions about donations. You know, yeah, if oh, I, I donate my cryptocurrency. Yeah. Yep. Hey, perfect. Hey, Wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, time, time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. Is that a lion's hat I see on your head? I am born and raised in Grand Rapids. Oh. I've always loved the underdogs. And I, I think I'm maybe like one of one of five five fans left. You know, oh, maybe, man. maybe yeah, I love obviously we're not going to the Super Bowl this year, but right. next year. <laughs> Next year. Next year's our year. I'm feeling it. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, man. I, I just had, I, I saw that. I'm like, <laughs> this guy has a lion's hat. He's got to be from Detroit. Oh, heck yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and, and I knew I, I came on the show because I saw, you know, hey, he's got a Red Wings hat. He's yeah. not a Blackhawks fan. Yeah, okay. I, I will give all sorts of free advice on that show for sure. <laughs> so, Nick, I don't know. I don't know what your hockey affiliations are. I see the, the New York hat there. So, as long as you're not a Blackhawks fan, I think we can no, keep talking. No, no Blackhawks. Okay. All right. We're <laughs> Great. good. So, um, with going, so jumping into donations, if you are giving to an actual legitimate charity, I can't just, you know, donate here, donate there. It has to be a 501c3 or, or the, you know, obviously a charitable organization for it to count as an actual donation. Mm-hmm. Um, what that will do is, you know, you, you get to choose either you give it at your, uh, basis and they recognize the, the basis and you get that deduction, or you can say, well, I'm going to give it to them at the fair market value. And then you get to basically you have the gain, but it gets offset by an equivalent amount of donation. Now, obviously, we'd have to balance that once again with the itemized because that's going to go on your Schedule A itemized deduction. So I'm not saying, well, you know, donate here and there and all over the place because you might still end up owing tax on that if you're not planning that well. Mm-hmm. Um, you can gift up to $14,000 to an individual when you gift that um, asset to them every year. Um, they pick up your basis in it. Now, if you were to die and leave it to your kids, all of those assets will step up to the fair market value. So, you know, obviously, I think there's a lot of young people in cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's planning on dying anytime soon that I've talked to. Um, but obviously, <laughs> we all would want to definitely kind of balance that for any of the you know older older investors of well, how do we make sure that your kids are left with this? And do they one do they even know about it? And two, how do we make sure that they're not getting screwed with with taxes after the fact? You know, you can give gifts up to uh, it's eleven million dollars, I think, and it phases out over the the next ten years with the new law. Um, of giftable income. That $14,000 limit, once you cross over that, you basically just have to fill out, once again, another compliance form of, hey, you know, I gave Jerry, you know, $15,000 worth of cryptocurrency mm-hmm. that goes into a file cabinet in the IRS and if they look at the end of the year, you know, when you die and you've given out to that one per- specific person more than the allotted limit or exemption, then all of a sudden you, the estate owes death tax on that. So that would be something that, you know, Obviously, don't be trading millions of dollars back and forth between friends. But uh, you know, I've had a couple of clients where, you know, hey, I gave my buddy this to invest for me. We didn't file any sort of partnership. We don't want to file a partnership. He gifted it back to me in here. So now we've got two gift transactions that we need to, to track. And, you know, your buddy's going to end up paying tax on what was transacted if he bought something for you and then give, gave back to you, just like you would be if you traded things and then gave it to him. So well, wait a minute. It, You're telling me that I know there are uh, people in the space that have helped their friends mm-hmm. get into yeah. crypto. They don't know how to use Ether Delta or any of these other exchanges. So, you know, they have them sign up for Coinbase and, and you know, they send them uh, their funds, whether it be, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, Ethereum, whatever, to, to that person. And then that person right. 
actually buys another cryptocurrency for them, then sends it back to them. What does that look like from a taxable event? Yeah. So, so for example, you know, for my brother's birthday, I buy him, you know, he gives me, you know, he says, Drew, I want to get in cryptocurrency. Can you help me out? And I say, mm-hmm. sure, man. So he gives me, you know, hundred dollars. I put that in my bank account. I jump on, uh, you know, Coinbase, load up that hundred dollars, mm-hmm. buy the hundred Ethereum. That that's technically legally mine. You know, he can right. give me the hundred dollars, but what I do with that, that that's my issue. There's no taxable event in buying the cryptocurrency. But what if he I actually that, buys it directly? He goes and signs up for a Coinbase account, and right. and then sends it to you. So he can send that to me. I inherit his basis. So if he buys a hundred dollars worth of Ethereum at a hundred dollars. And he sends it over to me, no matter what the price is, Mm -hmm. as long as he sends me that Ethereum, I inherit his $100 basis. So if it goes up to 150 the next day and I get all excited and I sell it, I now have a $50 taxable gain. So if I were to take that same $100 of Ether and go convert it to something else, and let's say, you know, we, we, I I, I like footy cash, it's it's growing. If I go Mm -hmm. convert that into footy cash Mm -hmm. and then bring that footy cash back and donate it to him, Mm -hmm. I have a taxable gain in the Ether to footy cash. But when I give him that footy cash, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden he doesn't have, he inherits my basis on the footy cash. So take that $100 worth of, crypt, or of Ethereum, transfer it over to Cryptopia. Mm-hmm. Cryptopia, it's you know, worth 150 I buy $150 worth of footy cash. I have a $50 taxable gain. I take that $150 worth of footy cash and give that to him. His basis in the footy cash is now $150. It's not taxable for me to take the footy cash and give it to him because it's a, a, a gift. You know, if I you know gave him over eleven million dollars over my lifetime, then he would I would owe taxes after I'm dead on that, or you know whoever the executor would owe taxes on that. But for me to to gift that to him, there's no tax in me moving that from my wallet to his okay. wallet. I just Great. need to denote that in my records, show that there's a gift. So if I do get audited, I can go, well, here's a gift, here's a gift, here's a gift, here's a gift. Right. And then you know that might open up some issues where well, if I show that I've given. Fourteen thousand dollars to my brother, and he traded a bunch of stuff, and then didn't disclose it and didn't file it. Now he's going to be liable for an audit. So, so is what, this, what they're looking for is the paper, the paper trail. So is this fourteen thousand dollars gifting per person? Like I can gift you fourteen thousand, you fourteen thousand, or is this overall? So the, the fourteen thousand dollars is the limitation per person okay. per year. Okay. That before you have to file the, the gift tax disclosure. Right. So, for example, you know. Using my brother as an example, if my wife and I both decide, hey, we want to give my brother, you know, $28,000, the way that we would structure that is 14000 of that because we're two people, even though we're regarded as one on our return. I can give him fourteen. My wife can give him fourteen, Even if it's in, you know, two transactions, that still keeps us under the limit for having to file that, that informational return. I can still straight up just give him $28,000. I just have to file that return with the IRS. And it goes, like I said, it goes into a filing cabinet. There's not any tax to do at that point in time. You okay. could give me fourteen thousand. You could give my wife fourteen thousand. Vice versa. You can basically go back and forth with that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, I mean that kind of kind of brings me to um, one of my questions. When you had brought up donations, I was more thinking mm-hmm. of of accepting donations. Like for example, me and Crypto Blood both have our own separate YouTube channels. We have our podcast yeah. channel, so we have donation links. People give us donations. Uh, how does that look? You know what I mean? It's pretty much, that was so, my question. So that kind of, kind of pretty much answers, yeah. answers that for the most part. So it, it, it depends whether or not, you know, obviously you want to make sure that your wording's correct. I, I think there's a difference between, uh, yeah, I should look at, you know, the intent. If it's, you know, you have to pay me, you have to gift me five, $5 worth of ether every month to have access to my, my premium channel. Mm-hmm. They're look at that and say, mm, that's income. You need to recognize that as income you would receive it at the fair market value mm-hmm. minus all of your expenses you know your web hosting you know, you know maybe you're buying three green screens a year because you really <laughs> like them um you know and that's how we'd work it out just like any other schedule c business i get paid in crypto mm-hmm. as well for some of the consulting that i do mm-hmm. i take that in i recognize it at the fair market value my liability insurance my legal costs you know my subcontractors all of that comes out and then i pay taxes on that that remaining balance I really would very carefully caution on how you treat that, whether or not you call that a gift or a donation. If you're not an actual 501c3 or an actual charitable organization. Right. Exactly. And that, yeah. that's the thing is I've seen some, some ICOs where it's like, well, we're a charitable organization. Yeah, but you've got no paperwork and you're actually headquartered in Zimbabwe and, mm-hmm. and you're not doing anything that resembles a charity. That's not going to fly. That's absolutely, you know, basically you would recognize a sale at that point of giving that away and 
you know, it's not money that's coming to you personally, but you're giving that, that same value out to somebody else. Okay. Um, so do you, do you, do you actually do taxes for people? Is that what Absolutely. you do? Yeah. So, so what do you, what we, do you, we do a mixture. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'll let you talk first and then I'll ask my question. Yeah. So, so we do kind of a mixture of the, for me, I love the tax planning. How do we make sure that every taxpayer is keeping the most dollars? That, that to me is always a fun conversation because I save people money and they're happy. Mm-hmm. I also do tax preparation and then accounting consulting. And I can help you get, if you're using uh, bitcoin.tax, I can help you get that set up. I can help you make sure that the, that looks right and balanced and, and we're good to go for the filings. I can do personal filings, business filings. Um, the crypto is going to end up on most people's personal returns. It's not a specific right. separate return that we file. It's an attachment to the return. But we do full service with all of that. Okay. And uh, is it kind of like a case-to-case basis or do you have like a general price that you usually charge when somebody is in crypto and you yeah. know, pretty active in crypto? How, how does it usually work with you? If, if, if you've got, I, I try to do flat rate. There's too many accountants and CPAs and EAs and, and professionals that are like, yeah, I charge $300 an hour. Well, yeah, that's great. If you're not, if you're using, you know, the hourly system, you better have your phone unplugged. And when you're working on my stuff for an hour, I, right. I want you to right. be fully divided. I don't want you to, to text your wife. I don't want you to you right. know, talk about your kid's recital. I want you to focus on that. I, I charge flat rate. I don't believe in this hourly nonsense nice. because sometimes, you know, I, I can at least, I, I know I'm a professional. I know how long it's going to take me to do something within reason. Um, so for me right now, I'm kind of looking at a pricing of $500 for accounting support and filing an individual return. Now, if we're talking about an individual that, well, yeah, I'm an individual, but I've got, you know, 14 real estate properties, three businesses, mm-hmm. uh, uh, corporate returns. You know, we're talking 1040 individual return with cryptocurrency. Books are relatively in order. You know, if, if we need to go back three years to get your books bounced for this year, that's going to be a, a different package. I would mm-hmm. lump that more under tax planning. You know, if I'm going to be doing the work anyways, we might as well do that. And that starts at two grand and just kind of goes up from there, depending on the level of involvement that, that they need. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for somebody who doesn't, you know, basically a lot of people got into cryptocurrency this past year in 2017. Um, yep. So say for example, like for myself, I own some Bitcoin, not much, but I really got super involved with cryptocurrencies at the very beginning of 2017 is when I started getting yeah. into Ethereum and buying into ICOs and stuff like that. So, Somebody who really hasn't kept good records at all, uh, what do you suggest? And, and what would you charge for somebody in that case? Yeah, so I mean, there's kind of two people in that, in that space. There's those that, that really want to get into their own books and, and see it and, and know. Um, mm-hmm. I would recommend, I, I use, like I said, I use the account version of Bitcoin.tax. All I need is your email address. Once you've got everything uploaded, I can go in and we can go in and make some, some adjustments. Um, if we're going to have to do a lot of digging in and handholding, it just depends. You know, Are we talking about you know, 17 exchanges where some of them don't export records and we kind of have to, I don't want to say make up the numbers, but give a best guess and, and basically say, here's our work. Here's how we figure this. This is the best records that we can get from this. You know, when you do that, you do lose out on a lot of money of potential losses being deducted. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, keep good records if you can. Keep, keep to exchanges that do export things in a CSV format or, right. you know, interface with some of these, these softwares. I, I can't recommend those tracking software is enough because it makes a very hard situation a lot easier mm-hmm. if we can lay it all out and then we kind of make some transactions to kind of get it into place and get everything to balance. Um, it, for that kind of, you know, holy crap, I have no idea what I'm doing. Give me a call. We'll sit down. We'll kind of talk about your situation and we'll come up with a price. Like I said, I start at $500. It's probably only going to go up from there. I, I don't want to yeah. ever do anything that isn't going to be a benefit to my clients. I, mm-hmm. I think if you've got a competent professional, they should be able to save you, you know, two to three times what you pay them. Otherwise, it makes for a really bad, you know, repeat business. Mm-hmm. I, I've got an incentive to take care of my people just from capitalism. I want to be working with people long term. I want to help people not only make good investment decisions from a tax standpoint, but also kind of help shepherd them into, well, let's look at some other options too. Yeah, it's great to play this up and down game, but why don't we talk about mining? Why don't we talk about non-traditional investments outside of crypto? Obviously, keep some stuff in crypto. Get some stuff mm-hmm. in traditional market. Let's get you in a 401k. You know, you can set those up through a mining business. There's no reason why you can't take that mining income, put it into what's called a SEP, which is a simplified mm-hmm. employee pension. If you're your own employee, you can take 25% of the net gains or up to $54,000, whichever one is less. And you can put that into a, uh, the SEP and then convert that SEP to a self-directed IRA and then buy cryptocurrencies in an IRA and let that grow long-term. 
So there's all these different things that we can do. It's all the same income. It's all about how we structure it and where we put it, what we call it, and what the law says. And we can play we can play the game very well, and we can we can really help people set themselves up for the long, medium, and short term. Very cool. Yeah, it, it sounds like you definitely know your stuff and know yeah, what you're it really doing does. And it, yeah. So and so you take clients all over the country. I do, I, and I've even got some international as well. As long as you're a U.S. citizen, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm a Canadian tax expert. I know enough <laughs> to, to kind of understand their law. We can get your 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 filings done. But all 50 states, I cut my teeth working with truck drivers. So I'm used to guys that are all over the country at any given yeah, time. Man. You know, we're, we're set up to be as mobile and responsive as possible. I've, I've fought with pretty much every state when I was doing back tax issues. So I know pretty well how most states operate okay. on top of filing their returns. My software helps me with all of that. So Cool. Cool. Well, yeah, we uh, are be giving you a call, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, <laughs> we definitely appreciate your time on the show, Drew. And I have yeah. the I have Andrew Kurnowski uh, information on the screen right now, people. Make sure you visit archertaxgroup.com or you can email him there. And uh, yeah, he, he definitely sounds like he's very versed and has a lot of experience in this space. So if you do need help, make sure you reach out to him. I will try to have him uh, kind of just look over the comment section because we, we normally get comments in these types of videos people have questions yeah. and stuff so we'll try to get drew if he's not too busy to just skim over if you guys have any questions that maybe not take up too much of his time um you can ask him there and uh yeah man that that's awesome information we really appreciate you coming on the show and uh yeah that's it sounds good well if you guys run into any other issues or if anyone makes a compelling argument against that 1031 exchange i'm open open to hear it but like i said i think i got the law on my side on that one but mm -hmm. we'll answer any and all questions that come our way excellent excellent yeah, excellent definitely. looking forward to talking on a one-on-one uh, -on -one basis for sure yeah <laughs> sounds good all so right. ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us for another episode of the block party with me crypto blood and me truth blitz and we are out of here people holla